seen one. The setting is Renfield's cell. <sighs> No. No. Let me go. Don't put me in there, please. <laughs> oh God, oh God. Dear God, keep me coming. He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> We begin our journey. Left Munich at 8.35 p.m. on the 1st of May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Budapest is wonderful. Welcome to Bukovina. Moldavia is in the midst of the Carpathians. We arrived in Klausenberg after nightfall. I stopped at the Hotel Royale and for supper I had a chicken done up in some way with red pepper. It was very good. I must remember to get the recipe for Mina. Welcome to the Carpathians. <laughs> Stopping at the Golden Crone Hotel for a change of horses. The Herr Englishman? Yes, Jonathan Harker. Ah, for you? Welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you and bring you to me. I trust your journey from London has been a happy one and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. Transylvania, one of the wildest and least known places in Europe. Must you go, young Herr? Must you go? Do you know what day it is? It is the eve of St. George's Day. For your mother's sake, don't go. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strike midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you're going and what you're going to? Wait a day or two at least. Take a crucifix. Welcome to the Borgo Pass. Then the Toten reiten schnell. The dead travel fast. There is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will come back with us and return in the daylight tomorrow or the next day or the next. You're early tonight, my friend. The English hare was in the hurry, so I thought... Oh. That is why I suppose you wished him to return with you. He cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are too swift. Give me the air's luggage. The night is chill, mine air, and my master, the Count, bade me take care of you. Mr Harker. Yes? Welcome to my house. Enter freely of your own will and leave some of the happiness that you bring. Count Dracula. I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker. Come in. You will no doubt need to refresh yourself after your journey. Your supper is prepared. I pray you be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me, that I do not join you, but I have dined already. I received this from your department, from um, a Mr. Hawkins. My superior, sir. Ah, yes, yes. 
He speaks most highly of you. A young man full of energy, he shall attend on you and will take instructions in all matters. <laughs> he is a most gracious employer. Mm. And you a most humble employee, my friend. Now, tell me of the house you and Mr. Hawkins have procured for me. Uh, yes, uh, the estate is called Carfax. Good. The house is very large and dates back to all periods. Uh, to medieval times, even. One part of the stone is immensely thick, but uh, only a few windows. Very good. They are heavily barred with iron. For safety? Absolutely. And the location? There are but few houses close at hand. One very large house that has been converted into a private lunatic asylum, but is not visible from the grounds. And nearby is a small chapel. I am happy for this. Oh, it's a most exceptional property. I'm, uh, I'm glad it is big and old. Uh, I am myself of old family, the Dracul, and to live in a new house would kill me. Well, the, the house is perfect. I rejoice also that there is a chapel. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. The walls of my castle are broken, the shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold. I love the shade and the shadows, and I care not to be alone, or rather be alone with my thoughts when I may. Yes. Yes, I understand. Do not be startled. Listen to them. The children of the night. What sweet music they make. Music? <laughs> ah, my young friend. You dwellers from the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter, the freedom, the thrill of the chase, the... My apologies. You must be tired. You must retire now and sleep as long as you will. I shall be away until the afternoon. Good night, Mr. Harker. Sleep well and dream well. Good night. Don't go. Take a crucifix. For your mother's sake, don't go. Do you know where you're going and what you're going to? Jonathan, I'm here. Can you feel me? Jonathan. Jonathan. Ah, damn. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think. In this country. Dracula smiles and takes the razor from Harker. Dracula wipes the trickle of blood from Harker's neck and begins to shave Harker himself. Tell me about your England. I have for many years been given the hours of pleasure. What of London? I have longed to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But alas, as yet, I only know your tongue through books. Oh, well, you speak English exceptionally well, Count. I thank you, my friend, for such flattering words. I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Your English is well studied and you've mastered it expertly. I know that did I move and speak in your London, none would know me here. Here I am a noble, a boyer. A common people know me and I am a master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. And to know not is to care not. Stranger in a strange land. You shall, I trust, rest here with me for a while, so that by our talking I may learn the English intonation. And I would that you would tell me when I make an error, even the smallest in my speaking. Of course. Thank you. Since your arrival, uh, have you written to your loved ones? Uh, I have dispatched to Mr Hawkins to inform him of my arrival. Pray, my friend, write to your loved ones and inform them that you wish to stay with me for a further month. 
Do you wish me to uh, stay so long? I desire it much. Nay, I take no refusal. When your employer engaged you to come to finalize my purchase of Carfax, it was understood that my needs, whatever they may be, would be met. Is that not so? Uh, indeed, Count, but... Uh, then you will stay, will you not? Of course. Good. Now, I trust you will forgive me, but uh, I have much work to do in private. Write the letters as I bid you. You may use my library if you wish. That is very kind of you, sir. You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where, of course, you will not wish to go. There is a reason that all things are as they are. And did you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would perhaps better understand. I am sure, sir. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. Let me advise you, my dear young friend, nay, let me warn you in all seriousness, that should you wish to leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now or ever overcome you, or be like to do, then haste to your own chamber, for your rest will then be safe. Come to us. Come lie with us, Jonathan. Harker does not hear the voices. He sits and begins to compose his letter to Mina. Dearest Mina, Dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I've simply been overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. My dearest Mina, you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote to you twice since we parted and your letter is only your second. I'm longing to be with you and by the sea. I wish you were here. I hear rumours of a forthcoming marriage. Rumours? There are so many rumours. I've had just a few hurried lines from Jonathan. He is in Transylvania, but hopes to return home soon. Men are so noble, aren't they? I don't know what to do. I miss him so. Yours, dearest Mina. Forever, Lucy. And so, dearest Mina, I decided to take in the sights of the Carpathians from the highest point of the castle. I came out of my room and went up to the stone steps to where I could look out over the mountains. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me. Not to read this letter, you will think me mad, but I write it all the same. I saw the Count slowly emerge from the window and crawl down the castle wall, face down. Do you know where you're going and what you're going to? At first I could not believe my eyes. I, th I thought it was a trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow, but I, I kept looking and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and the toes grasped the corners of the stones. I saw him move like a lizard moves along a wall. The dead travel fast. Jonathan, come lie with us. Jonathan, we need you. Jonathan, we want you. To say what I saw did not make me uneasy would be a lie. I'm not sure what manner of man my host is but I have a very uncomfortable feeling about my surroundings. So I thought it best to inspect a possible route out of the castle if the worst should befall me. Harker diligently continues to write his journal. Oh, my dearest Mina, how are you? You look radiant. As do you. How is Jonathan? 
Has he written again? I'm afraid not. It is most unlike him. His last letter was so cold, it didn't sound like him at all. Oh, you must miss him terribly. I do. He may not write because he's busy, but I am sure that you're constantly in his thoughts. Poor Jonathan. Anyway, Miss Westenra, you must tell me of these marriage proposals. <laughs> marriage proposals? I do not know what you are talking about, Miss Murray. <laughs> Lucy, you are a most frightful fibber. You blush whenever you tell a lie. I do not. Well, perhaps on occasion. So? Oh, my dear, I feel simply terrible. Here I am, who'll be 20 in September, and yet I never had a proposal until today. Not a real proposal. And today I've had two. It never rains, but it pours. Oh, Mina, isn't it awful? I feel truly sorry for the poor fellows, and it's made all the worse because I'm so happy and I don't know what to do with myself. Well, tell me about these fine gentlemen. I will tell you, but you must keep it a secret from everyone, except, of course, Jonathan. A future man and wife should have no secrets. Well, there was a knock at the door and in walked Dr. John Seward. Well, he runs his own lunatic asylum. He has a strong jaw and a good forehead. He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. He had obviously been preparing what he wanted to say, but in the midst of telling me the patterns of the seasons, he went to sit and missed the chair entirely. And I ended up as a heap on the floor. He quickly picked himself up and attempted to continue his rehearsed reading, but had completely lost his train of thought. Men don't normally do that if they are cool. For the rest of the interview, he was playing with his cufflink in a way which made me nearly scream. The poor dear was very sweet. He told me how he admired me and how, he, although he did not know me well, he had loved me from the moment we first met. When he asked me if I could love him in return, oh, I felt wretched as I shook my head, but my response seemed to remove all nerves in him. He rose and said that it would be his honour for us to be friends and he would care for me as such for the rest of his life if I allowed him. <laughs> A very sweet man. Indeed. And the second? Oh, Mina, I needn't tell you of the second, need I? Well, it was all so confusing. It seemed only a moment from him coming into the room till his arms were round me and he kissed me. I'm so happy and I don't know what I've done to deserve it. I just thank God for sending me such a true love, husband and friend. Does this gentleman have a name? Mr. Arthur Holmwood. Oh, Mina, he is so eloquent and loving as well as being so wonderfully clever and very I'm so pleased for you. And I know Jonathan will be taken with him. Failure. Last night I ventured to the front door to find the door locked and bolted with no sign of a key. The Count refers to me as his guest, but as the days go by I feel more and more like a prisoner. I have just seen the Count leave again in the same fashion as last night. So I will seek another means of escape. The dead to travel fast. You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the dock doors are locked, where of course you will not wish to go. Take the crucifix, the children of the night. Jonathan. Mina? We have waited for you, my love. Who's there? Come to us, Jonathan. <laughs> How dare you touch him? How dare you cast your eyes on him when I have forbidden it? This man belongs to me. Beware how you meddle with him or you will have me to deal with. I promise you that when I have finished with him, you shall have him. Go now. There is much work to be done. Am I to have nothing? <laughs> Only this. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, my friend, it is late. You must now go to your chamber. Where are they? Where are who? Uh, 
Please excuse me, Count. I, uh, I must have had a bad dream. Mr. Harker, tomorrow we must part. You return to your England. I must attend to some work which may have such an end that we may never meet. In the morning, some local gypsies who have labours of their own will, tr will, will arrive. When they have gone, my carriage will come back for you and conduct you back to the Borgo Pass to meet the coach to take you back to the Pess. But I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. Well, may I not go tonight, sir? No, because, sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. Well, I will walk with pleasure, sir. I want to get away at once. And your baggage? I do not care about it. I can send it for another time. You English have a saying which is close to my heart. Welcome the coming. Speed the parting guest. <laughs> Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour will you wait in my house against your will, though sad I am at your going and that you so suddenly desire it. Come. <laughs> Hark. Listen to them. Listen to them, Jonathan, the children of the night. What sweet music they make. Goodbye, Mr. Harker. I think tonight is not the best time to depart. I shall wait for your carriage as you so kindly offered. As you wish, my young friend. Jonathan, it's Nina. Won't you let me in? I will have you, my love. Back, back to your own place. Your time is not yet come. Wait, have patience. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, he is yours. <laughs> no man knows till he has suffered from the night, how sweet and how dear to his heart the morning can be. I, I must take some action now that the courage of the day is upon me. I have noted that it is always at night times when these frightful visions appear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps there while others are awake? And my experiences of the previous nights, I have seen the door to his room, but following the Count's instructions as to not enter with shut doors, I have stayed away. However, with my last day upon me, I'm no longer interested in keeping this courtesy. If I can get into his room, I may find another way out. Tomorrow I'm night, he is yours. yours. Take the crucifix. The dead travel fast. Jonathan. All is quiet. The door is shut and locked from the outside. There's no escape. I am alone in the castle with these awful women. They are devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I will follow the Count's example. I will scale the castle walls and find my way to the river below one way or another. I, I, I must away from this cursed spot, from this cursed land where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. God's mercy is better than these monsters. Goodbye, Mina. There is now a meeting between Seward and Renfield. I cannot eat. I cannot sleep and I cannot rest. I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems to matter. But I know the only cure for this sort of heartbreak is work. So, to work. Diary entry. I have a new patient. English law degree, recently returned from Europe. He is a strange sort of fellow. He is so quiet in his ideas and so unlike the normal lunatic that I am determined to understand him as well as any man can. A Mr. R. M. Renfield. 
sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out, most probably dangerous to himself and to others. I find his case most interesting. He has certain qualities which are very largely developed. Selfishness, secrecy and purpose, although what the purpose of his behaviour is, I have yet to discover. Dr. Seward. Hmm? Dr. Seward, come to me. Hmm. One redeeming feature is his apparent love for animals, although unlike a cat or a dog, his love seems to lie more on the side of the smaller, baser creatures. At the moment, his hobby is catching flies. Dr. Seward, <laughs> where are you? Ah, hmm? Mr. Renfield. Ah, Jack, uh, how are you? I, I would prefer you to address me as doctor. Thank you, Mr. Renfield. Why, of course, Dr. Jack. <laughs> Now, Mr. Renfield, I really will have to ask you to remove all these flies in here. It is becoming rather cramped. <sighs> Dr. Jack, uh, please, may I have just three more days and then I shall clear them away? He answered me in such a gentlemanly way that I replied, well, yes, of course. And, and, and true to his word, he got rid of every single fly every single one that he'd been keeping, but not quite in the manner that I had expected. He now keeps what I can only describe as an army of spiders who feast on his most previous beloved flies. Mr. Renfield. Mr. Jack. Now, sir, can you please tidy this place up? It is becoming a state again. But Jack, I have done as you said. The flies. Well, I are gone. May I have oh, yes. oh, three... I, I give you three further days, Mr. Renfield. Thank you, Doctor. I must keep an eye on how he gets rid of the spiders. They are wholesome and good for me. I fear not, sir. They are full of life. Strong life. <laughs> And <laughs> they give me life. Dr. Seward, they give life to me. Do they indeed? They do, sir. But I would happily rid myself of them if you were to do something for me. And what would that something be? I want something. Yes. A kitten. <laughs> A nice, sleek, playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and <laughs> feed and feed and feed. And... I, I, I will think about it, but, but uh, let me ask you, sir, why a kitten? Why not a cat? Oh, yes, a cat. <laughs> I would like a cat. I, I I only ask for a kitten lest you should refuse me. <gasps> a cat. Uh, no one would refuse me. A little kitten, would they? No, no, I suppose they couldn't. However, it will not be possible to get you one at the present, but I shall see about it. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> On this remark, his face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it, a sudden, fierce, sidelong look, which meant killing. This man is an undeveloped maniac. On my next visit, he was even more intense. Doctor, it is vital that I have a cat. My salvation depends on it. Mr. Renfield, I have already told you, not at the present time. I know, at the present time, yes. I know, Doctor. <laughs> but please, 
Let me have one. I'm sorry, sir, but uh, no. A cat, sir. I want a cat and I will have a cat. Do you hear me, you bastard? I want a cat. Bring me a cat now. I have given him a strong opiate. Enough to make him sleep. Now, what an interesting case I have on my hands. I have created a new name for his condition. He is a, zoophy a zoophagus maniac. A life-eating maniac. And from my meeting and observations of him, I conclude that his drive seems to be to absorb as many lives as he can. I shall continue to conduct my investigations into this. Um, and personally, I am glad of this intriguing case as, as, as my mind wanders to pains close to my heart. Lucy! 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 <laughs> Lucy! Lucy! Wake up, Lucy. Come back to bed, my dear. Lucy, it is cold out. We are in for a storm this evening. Come back to bed. Lucy, he's coming. The dead travel past. This is the Demeter, en route to Whitby from Varna. Cargo, silver, sand, several boxes of common earth. She is struggling in this weather. The crew are missing. Left Varna with five hands, my ship's mate and myself. There remains just myself. The ship is surrounded by a garish mist and cannot see the coast. Immediate assistance required. Lord, save their souls. Look at the sea. The waves must be ten feet high. There's something not right about her. She's buckling under the strain. Oh, look at the fog. Poor devils. They can't try to land in this. He's coming. Den die Toten reiten schnell. Listen to them, the children of the night. Lucy, where are you, Lucy? Lucy. Lucy. You will not see me. Lucy. Mina? Mina, where am I? You were sleepwalking, my dear. Come, let me help you home. The dream was so frightening. What did you dream? Well, I didn't quite dream, but it all seemed so real. I only wanted to be here, in this spot. And I don't know why, for I was, a, I was afraid of something, and I don't know what. I remember, though I suppose I was asleep, passing through the street and over the bridge. I heard lots of dogs howling. Then I have a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes, just as we saw in the sunset. And something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once. And then I felt like I was sinking into deep green water and there was a singing in my ears, as I've heard there is to drowning men. And then everything seemed to pass away from me. My soul seemed to go out of my body and float in the air. Then there was this agonizing feeling as, as if I were in an earthquake and I came back and found you shaking my body. Oh. I saw you do it before I felt you. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Thank you for coming to find me. It's lucky you found me before anyone else who knows what may have happened. Stop, my dear, please. Uh, strange and sudden change in Mr. Renfield. Last night at around one o'clock, he began to get excited and sniff about like a dog. Now he's normally very courteous towards me, but tonight, Get out of my sight! I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you don't count now. The master visitor. <laughs> Mr. Renfield, that is not the way to talk to your doctor. Now, why do you not want to speak to me? Have I offended you in some way? The master is come. Who is, that? <laughs> Who is that? I don't want to see you. Leave me alone. 
But what about your idea of keeping a cat? W would that not interest you? Or would you care to keep some more spiders or flies? Bother them all. I don't care a pin about them. What? <laughs> you, you, you don't mean to tell me you don't care about spiders? The bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride. But when the bride draws nigh, then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled. Yes, can, can you explain? I could. And that was all he would say. I am concerned that he has been seized by some sort of religious mania. I am here to do your bidding, Master. I am your slave. And you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and far often. Now that you are near, I await your commands, and you will not pass me by, will you? Dear Master, in your in your distribution of things. I have given him a double dose of laudanum tonight and have instructed that he be moved to the padded cells until I can be sure that he will not be a danger to himself or others. I shall be patient, Master. I listen for you. <gasps> And the children of the night. <laughs> Mina, I've just heard Mr. Holmwood is on his way here. Ah, so I finally get to meet the man that has stolen your heart. Oh, Mina, how over-romantic you are. He didn't steal anything. I gave him my heart. Ah, and you call me the over-romantic one. Oh, what should I do? One thing, my dear. I have found in these early meetings that the lady does not need to do anything. The gentleman will lead the conversation. How right you are, Mina. Mr. Arthur Homewood. <laughs> Lucy. Lucy, my darling. Arthur, this is Miss Wilhelmina Murray, future Mrs. Harker. Good day to you, sir. I've heard much about you. As I have you, Miss Murray. Mr. Holmwood, if we are to be so closely related, it does not seem right for you to always address me as Miss Murray. Please call me Mina. Well, thank you, Mina. And you must likewise call me Arthur. You are too kind, sir. Oh, I'm so glad the two of you have finally met the two most important people in my life. I hope I have not intruded upon you. Not at all. In fact, Lucy and I were about to take a walk and get some fresh air. Perhaps you would like to join us. I would be delighted. Lucy, dear, go and wrap up warm. It is rather cold outside. Mr. Holmwood, I must speak with you. Well, of course. What would you like to discuss? Lucy. Is anything the matter? Well, no, nothing I would worry about for now. Is she not eating? No, she, she eats well. Is she sleeping? She sleeps well. Then what could be wrong with her? You promised not to discuss this with Lucy, for if she knew I was speaking about her without her knowledge, particularly about her health, it would sadden her. Yes, I, I promise. Have you noticed a change in her? In her face, perhaps? Her rosy cheeks are fading and she appears to be becoming physically weaker. At night, I hear her gasping for air. Also, I do not think it means anything, but I've noticed two small marks on her neck, the size of a pinprick. I know one of them was made by my clumsiness when I pinned my shawl on her when she was cold, but how the other appeared, I do not know. The wounds are still open, and if anything, larger than before. They're like white dots with red centers. If they do not heal in a few days, I'll ask her to see her doctor. Thank you for keeping watch over her, Mina. I will be extra vigilant. Mina! 
What is it? Just what you've been waiting for. Jonathan. Well, I don't know anybody else that lives in Budapest. Look at the postmark. Are you going to open it? What does it say? It's not from him. It's from a father, Augustine, who works at a hospital in Budapest. Well, what's wrong? Jonathan has been very ill. He says he is suffering a violent brain fever and is in his infirmity, dearest Jonathan asked him to write to me. Apparently he's had a fearful shock and in the darkest moments of the fever, his ravings have been dreadful of wolves, poison and blood and of ghosts and demons. He advises that he must relax and avoid anything that may reignite the fever. But we should look to the positives and that Jonathan seems to be over the worst of it. And he's expressed his wish that I should go to Budapest as Jonathan wishes to marry me at once. Oh, you must go to him, Nina. You must go at once. But what about you? You've been feeling a little unwell the last few days. Oh, I'm fine. Believe me, I'm absolutely fine. You must go to Hull, board a ship, and go immediately to Jonathan. If you are sure. I'm positive. Arthur will be here to look after me. In Mina's absence, I will consider it my honour to stay with you. Then that is settled. Now, off you go, Mina, before I change my mind. The case of Renfield grows even more exciting and interesting. He seems to have quietened down after the spells of violence and moments of extreme silence and then awful screaming fits. But this momentary stillness seems to have coincided with the full moon rising. Now I can wait. <laughs> now I can wait. <laughs> How are you, Mr. Renfield? You think the tie could hurt you. <laughs> Why would I want to hurt you? <laughs> I fancy me hurting you, <laughs> fool. <laughs> it seems my well-being was needful to him, but he will not say much more. He will only say, I, I don't take stock in cats. I have more to think of now, and I can wait. I can wait. Wait for what? <laughs> the master. The ma who, who's the master? Who's the, the master? master? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell. Where's the master? Where's the master? Can't tell. Perfect. I feel there's something ominous in his calm. We are now in an infirmary in Budapest. A weak Jonathan Harker lies in bed. Jonathan. 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 Get away from me! Jonathan, it's all right. It's Mina. My dearest Mina, it's you. How are you? Oh. Father, Augustine treats me well. And your work? You have completed it well? I trust Lucy as well. She's been looking to you, I trust. Lucy as well. She worries about you. She is to be married next year to a Mr. Arthur Holmwood. I believe between the two of them, they shall own half the town when he inherits. Soon there will be the patter of little children. Of the night. You must be Miss Murray. I recognize you from Jonathan's photograph. It is a time for him to rest now. I fear it might tax his poor brain if he would try to recall it. Recall what? 
why was he was in the darkest moments of the fever? He raved of dreadful things. What were they? What dreadful things? I, I cannot tell you. The ravings of the sick are the secrets between them and God. And if a priest through his vocation should hear them, he should respect his trust. Uh, but I can just tell you this much, my dear, that it was not about anything which he had wrong, done wrong himself. And you, as his wife, have no cause to be concerned. <laughs> he has not forgotten you or what he owes to you. His fear was of great and terrible things which no mortal can treat of. Pass me my coat. Wilhelmina, you know, dear, my ideas of the trust between husband and wife. There should be no secret and no concealment. I have had a, a great shock. And when I try to think of what it is, I feel like my head spins around and uh, I do not know if it was uh, real or the dream of a madman. You know, I have had brain fever and that, that is to be mad. The secret is here. I do not want to remember it. I want to take up my life here without marriage. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here is the book. Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know unless, unless some, some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. The chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. Jonathan has asked for you to be married within the hour. I will keep the book, Jonathan, and it will be a sign that all our lives we will trust each other and I will never open it unless for your poor sake. Stranger in a strange land, I have come to know much about your great England and to know her is to love her. Time has moved, and we are now in Dr. Seward's office. Night of adventure. Renfield waited until I entered the room to inspect its cleanliness, and without word or warning, he flew past me, through the door, and down the passage. I followed with the attendants in tow, but somehow Renfield had gotten outside the boundaries of the asylum and was running towards Carfax. Uh, we found him against the old chapel door, jabbering incoherently. But when he saw me, he became furious and had the attendants not seized him, he would have tried to kill me. However, as he was being held, a strange thing happened. He grew calm. His eyes had become fixed on something above. I looked, but I could see nothing except in the moonlit sky. A big bat. I shall continue to observe this intriguing case. My dear Jack. Oh, Arthur, what a surprise. I had not expected to see you. And I would have expected you to be with Miss Westenra, for I hear you are to be married. My congratulations. It is Lucy I have come about. Oh? In what capacity? I came to ask her advice as a doctor and as a friend. I want you to do me a favor. Lucy is very ill. That is, she has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I've asked her if there is any cause, but she says nothing. I'm sure that there is something wrong with my dear girl's mind. I told her I should ask you to see her. She said she would rather not. Did she say why? Don't worry, old fellow. I know why. You do? It will be a painful task for you, I know, but it is for her sake. Will you consent? Well, yes, of course. 
Then go. I, I shall remain here until you return. I'm sure your examination needs no more audience for your sake. We are now in Lucy's house. So, how are you feeling, Miss Western Ra? I cannot tell you how I loathe talking about myself. Well, I can tell you that I am your doctor and that everything you tell me is in strictest confidence. Jack, how sweet and thoughtful you are. I, I must tell you, Miss Weston, rather, that Mr. Homewood is grievously anxious about you. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but all for him. Well, very well. But, um, well, tell me where you are feeling ill. I do not feel ill. Sometimes I have difficulty in breathing and have a very heavy lethargic sleep with dreams that frighten me. What is it that frightens you? I can't remember. As a child, I used to walk in my sleep and when Mina came to stay with me, the habit came back. One night I walked out in the night and Mina found me at the end of a cliff overlooking the sea. Well, uh, well this, is, this is not an area I am fully familiar with, uh, but I... Well, I do know a specialist in these matters. Her name is Professor Van Helsing, and she is a great and trusted mentor of mine and respected all over Europe. She knows what she is talking about better than anyone else. Will you let me send for her? I'm perfectly well. I told you. Yes, but as your doctor, will you allow me to do what I think is best? And as your friend, let me help you. I don't see what the fuss is about, but if you and Arthur insist... I do insist. If you and Arthur insist, then I shall have little choice. You men, always fussing around me with your little worries. Sleep well, Lucy, and dream well. Oh, it's so cold in here. How dare you, how dare you touch her? This girl belongs to me. She is mine. Beware how you meddle with her, or you will have me to deal with me. Professor Van Helsing examines Lucy. Have you said anything to the lover? No, not yet. No, I thought it best for you to examine her first. Quite right. Better he not know what might lay ahead. Why? Um, what, what, what do you think it might be? Ah, my good friend, John, you deal with the madmen. Well, yes, indeed, I do. All men are madmen in some way or another. And you deal with your madmen in one way. So yes. the world deals yes. with God's madmen in another. You tell not your madmen what to do or why you do it. So you and I will keep our thoughts here and here. I have for myself thoughts on what you have told me. Later, I shall unfold them to you in the fullness of time. Now. Take me to the young lady so I might make a diagnosis. Oh my God. This is dreadful. There is no time to be lost. She will die for sheer want of blood to keep the heart's action as it should be. Yeah. There must be a transfusion of blood at once. Is it you or me? Well, I, I am the younger and stronger, it, it, Professor. It, it must be me. Then get ready at once. I am prepared. What's going on, Lucy? Sir, you have come just in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. I am. She's bad. Very, very bad. You are to help her. You can do more than any that live. Your courage is your best help. Tell me, what can I do? Tell me and I shall do it. My life is hers and I would give the last drop of my blood in my body for her. My young sir, I do not ask so much as that, yet. What shall I do? Come, you are a man and it is a man we want. She wants blood and blood she must have or die. My friend John and I have consulted and we are about to perform what we call a transfusion of blood to transfer from full veins of one to the empty veins of another. If only you knew how gladly I would die for her, you would understand. 
good boy. In the not so far off, you will be happy that you have done all for her you love. Come now and be silent. You shall kiss her once before it is done, but then you must go and you must leave at my sign. Now, little miss, here is your medicine. Drink it off like a good child. See, I lift you so that to swallow is easy, yes? You may take that one little kiss now. You attend him, I will see to her. A transfusion takes place, and then we move forward in time as time elapses. The brave lover, I think, deserves another kiss, which he shall have presently. You must now go home and rest. I can tell you, sir, that the operation has been successful. You have saved her life this time, and you can go home and rest easy in mind that all that can be is. I shall tell her all when she is well. She shall love you nonetheless for what you have done. Goodbye, my young friend. Will she be all right now? What do you make of the mark on her throat? Uh, what did you make of it? I can make nothing of it yet. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight. There are books and things there which I want. You must remain here all night and you must not let your sight pass from her. But, but shall I have a nurse? <sighs> no. We are the best nurses, you and I. You keep watch all night, yeah. see that she is well fed and that nothing disturbs her. You must not sleep all night. Later on, we can sleep, you and I. I shall be back as soon as possible and then we may begin. May begin? What on earth do you mean? We shall see. Remember, she is your charge. If you leave her and harm befall, you shall not sleep easy thereafter. I will not leave her side. The dead travel fast. Sleep well. Dream well. The dead travel fast. Oh, you must sleep, Miss Westenra. I do not want to. You do not want to go to sleep? No, I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid to go to sleep? Why? I mean, this is the boon we all crave for. Not if you like me. If sleep was to you a presage of horror. A, a presage of horror? What on earth do you mean? I don't know. And that is what is so terrible. All this weakness comes to me in sleep until I dread the very thought of it. But, but my dear girl, you may sleep tonight. I am here watching you, and I can promise that nothing will happen. I promise you that if I see any evidence of bad dreams, I will wake you at once. You will? <laughs> How could you are to me? I will sleep. Sleep well. Dream well. All night long I have watched by her. She never stirred, but slept on and on in a deep, tranquil, life-giving, health-giving sleep. Her lips were slightly parted and her breast rose and fell with the regularity of a pendulum. There was a smile on her face and it was evident that no bad dreams had come to disturb her peace. So... No more sleeping for me. And no more sitting up for you tonight, Mr. Seward. You are worn out. And I'm quite well again. It is I who will sit up. So. And I, I am better. Ah. Uh, are you better already? I am much better, Professor, but dearest Jack is awfully tired. He hasn't slept in three nights. That is good to hear, Miss Lucy. Now I have a present for you. For me? Indeed, 
but these are not for you to play with. These are medicines. They are not to take in concoction form. So you need not snub that charming nose. Or I shall point out my friend Arthur, what woes he may have to endure in seeing so much beauty that he loves so much distort. Aha, my pretty miss, that brings that so nice nose all straight again. This is medicinal, but you know not how. I put him in your window and around your neck and so that you may sleep well. Around my neck? Quite so, then you will sleep. Oh, Professor, I believe you are playing a joke on me. These flowers are but common garlic. Oh. No trifling with me, I never jest except about noses. I only do so for your good, but there is much pleasure, virtue in you. So those so common flowers, see, I place them myself in your room. I make myself the wreath that you are to wear. Jack, what does she mean? Well, I, I'm not entirely sure. Professor, I, I know you always have a reason for what you do, but this puzzles me. It is well we have no sceptic here, or they would say that you, you are working a spell to keep out an evil spirit. Perhaps I am. Take care you do not disturb it. And even if the room feel close, do not tonight open the window or the door. I promise. And thank you a thousand times. I do not know what I would have done to be blessed by such good friends. Have a good night, Miss Lucy. Tomorrow in the morning we will come and see you. Good night. Girl belongs to me. She is mine. Beware how you meddle with her, or you will have me to deal with. As Lucy falls to sleep, a soundscape of the voices and a nightmarish atmosphere induces a tremulous sleep. As Lucy tosses and turns, she finds the garlic uncomfortable and unbearable to smell. She finds it harder and harder to breathe until she writhes and pulls the garlic from around her throat. After it is gone, she lays still, but panting, remaining asleep. Dracula enters and bites her throat as Lucy drives in pain and ecstasy. The next morning, Van Helsing returns with Stuart. Oh! My God, she is dying. It will be much difference, mark me, whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. Lucy. My God, Lucy. Oh, I'm so glad you've come. Professor, she has had put in her veins the blood of two strong men. Her whole body wouldn't hold that much. What took it out? That is the crux of it. Kiss me. No, not yet. Hold her hand, it will comfort her more. Kiss me! Lucy, dear, rest. I love you. Kiss me. Kiss me now. Not for your life. <sighs> My true friend and his. Guard him and give him peace. I swear it. Come, take her hand in yours. Kiss her on the forehead and only once. It is over. She is dead. Lucy. Dear God. Dear. Dear God. Poor oh, girl. Well, there is peace for her at last. It is the end. Not so, Jack. Professor? It is not the end. It is only the beginning. The beginning? Indeed, dear Jack. Now, tomorrow, I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. But must we make a, 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 an autopsy on poor Lucy? Yes and no. I want to operate, but not as you think. Let me tell you now, not a word to another. Do you, do you swear, Jack? I, I do, Professor. Good. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. What? Well, why on earth would you want to... 
Oh, you are a surgeon and so shocked. You whom I've seen with no tremble of hand or heart do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. We shall right. unscrew the coffin lid and we shall do our operation and then replace all so that none know save we alone. Why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, why do it? We have been friends many years, you and I. And yet, did you ever know me to do anything without good cause? Was it not for these causes that you were for me when the great trouble came? Were you not amazed when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying? And yet you saw how she thanked me with those so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too so weak, and she kissed my rough old hand and blessed me. And did you not hear me swear, promise her to keep Arthur safe? Well, there are strange and terrible things before us. We must work together. Will you have faith in me? I shall. The setting is Lucy's funeral. Van Helsing begins to write a letter to Mina. Dear Mrs. Mina Harker, you will be grieved to know that five days ago, Miss Lucy Weston died. There is a wealth of sorrow in these words. God save us all. Agnus Dei, quit allis peccata mundi, criminatolis aspera mollis agnus honoris, miserere nobis. Agnus Dei, quit allis peccata mundi, vulneras sanas ardua planas agnus amoris. Miserere nobis, agnus Dei, quit allis peccata mundi, sordida mundas, concta fecundas, agnus odoris, dona eis requiem. Mrs. Harker. Mina. Mrs. Harker, is it not? That was Mina Murray. I am Dr. Van Helsing. It is on account of poor dear Lucy that I must speak with you. Madam, you could have no better claim on me than that you are a friend and helper of Lucy Weston Rock. May I speak plainly? You can indeed, madam. I understand that sometimes Lucy kept a diary. That is true. And in that diary, she talks of her sleep walking along the cliff and you saving her. That is true. I wonder then if you would be so kind as to tell me what you remember of that night. I can remember everything of that night, Doctor. Ah, excellent. Very good. It is not always so with young ladies. I am not like all young ladies. So it appears. I took the precaution of noting all that Lucy told me in a small diary. Though I do not see why it would be of any consequence to anyone now. May I read that notebook? If you wish. But doctor, what use is knowing of Lucy's terrible sleepwalking going to be to you now? It is for the benefit of those we cannot yet identify. I believe it was a symptom and I wish to read the notebook to gain knowledge that may help others who may be afflicted with her illness. Thank you for the notebook. It is most useful. Your husband is quite well. I understand he has had a fever. He is over the worst of it now. That is good. I love your lantern. It's life. It's death. Oh my God. Do you see who it is? No, dear. Who is it? It's the man himself. Which man? I believe it is the Count. He's grown young. 
my god oh my god it, it this be so oh my god if only i knew it if only i knew younger i'm afraid doctor he may still be suffering with the fever if your husband suffer he suffer within the range of my study and experience i promise you that i will gladly do all i can for you and him i shall make him strong once more dr van helsing what I have to tell you is so strange that you must not laugh at me or my husband. My dear, if you only knew how strange the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of anyone's belief, no matter how strange. My husband kept a journal when he was in Transylvania. Transylvania? I promised him I would not read it. I dare not say anything of it either. Madame Mina. I will read it and I will come to see you and your husband. When? Tomorrow. First Blue for Lady reports. The neighborhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, a stabbing woman, the woman in black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a bloofer lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missing, and on two occasions the children have not been found until early the following morning. The story from the majority of these children is that the bloofer lady had asked them to go for a walk with her. Some of the tiny tots are even playing a game where they pretend to be the bloofer lady, which is extremely funny. <laughs> there is possibly a serious side to the question as some of the children, indeed all who have been missing at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wounds seem such as might be made by a rat or a small dog and although of not much importance individually, whatever, the animal inflicting these wounds has a system and a method of its own. The police have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children and for any stray dog which may be in the area. Professor Van Helsing begins to read Harker's diary. I fear, Doctor, that you may think me a fool. Some may say. I'm not a fool, Doctor. I know, sir. You may sleep without doubt of that, because strange and terrible as it is, it is the truth. Thank God. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, a thousand thank yous for your kind words. It has taken a weight off my mind. But, Doctor. Yes. If it be true, what terrible things are there in the world? And what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really here in London. Doctor, how can I thank you? You have cured me. How so? I was in doubt. And then everything that took a hue of unreality. I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do. I mistrusted myself, Doctor. You don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. Always trust your instincts. I will. Come, we must be friends. We must be friends all our lives. And now, may I ask for some more help? I have a great task to do, and you have the power to help me. What is it you need? Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Uh Look here, sir. Does what you have to do concern Count Dracula? It does. Then I am with you, heart and soul. Second Blue for Lady reports. Yamstead or up. Another child injured. We have just received intelligence that another child went missing last night and was discovered this morning on Hampstead Heath. It has the same tiny wounds in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. 
it too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the bloofer lady. My this is God. the suspicion of vampires. My God, what do you think of that? Well? Ah, uh, yes. Um, with the same symptoms as poor Lucy. And what do you make of it? Well, simply that there is some cause in common. I mean, whatever it was that injured her, injures them. This is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? Look, tell me, I can, I, I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think. Do you mean to tell me, my friend, that you have no suspicions as to what Lucy died of? Well, um... Of nervous prostration, following on a great loss or waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or waste? I do not know. You were one of my cleverest students, Jack. Yet you do not let your eyes see nor your ears hear. Do you not think that there are things in this world which you cannot understand and that some people see things that others cannot? Professor, please let me be your pet student again. T tell me the thesis that I may apply your knowledge as you go along. I shall tell you. My thesis is this. I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Now tell me. You think that those small holes in the children's throats were made by the same creature that made holes in Miss Lucy? Yes, I suppose so then you are wrong. I wish it were so, but alas, no, it is worse, far, far worse. In God's name, Professor Helsing, what do you mean? They were made by Miss Lucy. Are you mad, Professor? Would I were. Madness is easy to bear compared with truths like this. Tonight, I go to prove it. Will you come with me? We will have to get Arthur's blessing. The poor chap has suffered enough. I, I, I do not think he will be able to stomach any more. This is where Professor Van Helsing seeks to ask Arthur's permission. I want your permission to do what I think is good this night. It is, I know, much to ask. When you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then, how much. Therefore, May I ask that you promise me, though you may be angry with me for some time, you will not blame yourself for anything. If you can assure me that what you intend to do does not violate my faith or honour, then I can give my consent at once. I accept your limitation. Now, may I ask what it is you are to do? I want you to come with me to the churchyard where dear Miss Lucy is buried. For what purpose? to enter the tomb. Professor, is this some monstrous joke? It, it's all right, Arthur. Pardon me, Professor. I see that you are in earnest. What do we do once we've entered the tomb? We open Miss Lucy's coffin. This is too much, madam. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this, this, this is desecration of the grave. I will hear no more. Would it not be well, sir, to hear what I have to say? Just listen to her for a moment, Arthur. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Then there can be no wrong to her. But if she be not dead... What do you mean? Has she been buried alive? I did not say she was alive. But what I say is that she may be among the undead. What do you mean? This is some form of nightmare. It is no nightmare. It is real. Now, may I ask you if I have your permission to cut off the head of the dead Miss Lucy? Not for the whole wide world would I consent to any mutilation of her dead body. I have a duty to do in protecting her grave from outrage, and by God I shall do it. I also have a duty to do. I swore to Miss Lucy that I would guard you and protect you, and that is what I intend to do. And believe me, my friend, you will not find peace until Miss Lucy is at rest. Which leads us to the post-mortem of Lucy.
This is desecration of the grave, madam. You will soon understand. Oh, the dead travel fast. I love your London. It's life. <laughs> it's death. Good Lord. Oh, just as you said. Have you done this? I swear to you, I have not touched her. Then where is her body? Is this a joke, madam? It is no joke. Is it a mistake? No mistake. Then tell me, for the love of God, what is going on? La, 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 Arthur, come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, we can rest together. Come, my husband, come. My God, Lucy. <laughs> <sighs> Get back for where you came from. <sighs> Mr. Homewood, answer me now. Am I to proceed with my work? Do as you will. Do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever anymore. Is, is, is this really Lucy's body or, or, or some demon in her shape? It is her body and yet not. But wait a while and you shall see, she ha as see her as she was. But before we do anything, let me tell you this. With the power of being undead also comes the curse of immortality, Arthur. If I had let you kiss her the night she died, you would in time, when you had died, become Nosferatu. Those children whose blood she has sucked will recover if the demon responsible is killed. It is my place to do this. Tell me what I must do and I, I shall not fault. Brave lad, we must drive this wooden stake through her heart and then cut off her head. When you strike, all will be well with the dead that we love, and the undead shall be no more. A stake is driven through Lucy's heart. She would hold her down until she falls silent. In the midst of this, Van Helsing is reciting Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me waters. Beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yet, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He is mine. You cannot touch her, or you will have me to deal with me. Now you may kiss her, for she is not a grinning devil now. No longer is she the devil's undead. She is God's true dead whose soul is with him. Lucy, my child, so sweet and innocent, now gone, you shall pay. This all culminates, and Lucy's head is cut off. End of Act One, ladies and gentlemen. Just a short interval. I hope you're well. Um, thank you to the guys and guys, uh, guys in the uh, cast. Um, fabulous watching it. It's amazing to sit here and look at that and be part of it. And I'm so delighted. Don't forget, you can go to the poster, the website. Active for Others is the donation we want to go to. You can help so many of people in this industry, not just actors. We've got creatives, wardrobe, wigs, flymen, uh, transport, everybody. The, the industry is, you know, on its knees, as we all know. So please do contribute some more if you can. 
it all really does help. A pound, up to 50, up to 100, up to 1,000, we don't care. It's all going to help this industry, which hopefully will be back in 2021. And uh, all we can do is thank you as um, artists that you're supporting us and listening to us this evening. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of myself, Michael Ross, I'd like to now carry on. We go straight into Act Two, and uh, we're in Scene One. Act Two, Seward meets Mina. When I arrived back at the asylum, there was a telegram waiting for me, and it, it was from Mrs. Harker. Ah. Professor Van Helsing has spoken to me of her, and it is apparent that she needs my help. She and her husband will be staying with me for a few days. Dr. Seward, is it not? Uh, you must be Mrs. Harker. I saw you at the funeral. I thought it may be you, as I have heard your description from poor dear Lucy. Yes. I have just come from Mr. Holmwood's. Oh, so how is Arthur? Poor old fellow. He needs all the comforting he can get. No one but a woman can help a man when he is in trouble of the heart. And he has no one to, to comfort him. I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend? And will you come to me for comforting if you need it? Oh, that is most kind of you, my dear. We need have no secrets amongst us. We must work together with absolute trust. We can surely then be stronger than if some of us were in the dark. Well, of course, you're quite right. Now, your telegram said that I was also to expect your husband. Yes, he'll be following shortly. He's gone to Whitby. What for? He thought it best to return to make, as he would say. On the spot inquiries. In order to track down the Count, I began to search through my now returning memories of that hideous place and recalled that I had saw several boxes being taken away on one of the evenings. To trace what these were, I began to track any ships departing from the local port of Vanya, heading towards England. When searching, I came across a, an SOS call amongst the shipping records, detailing that the Demeter had sailed from Varna and crashed into Whitby Harbour carrying several boxes of earth aboard. Almost certainly the boxes I was tracking. Dr. Van Helsing informs me that the night of the crash was also the night Lucy first slept walk. He therefore believes that Count Dracula was also aboard and has traveled with his cargo to the place he now lodges in England. It is now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the Counts to its place in London. There were 50 cases of common earth on board the Demeter when it sailed into Whitby. Mr Billington, who collected the boxes from the ship, said the boxes had left King's Cross to be delivered to Pure Fleet. Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all the boxes which arrived at Whitby from Varna at the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at Carfax. There should be 50 of them there, unless they have since moved. Mina meets Renfield. Jonathan is attempting to find someone who may be linked to Lucy's mysterious illness. I am compiling evidence from the diaries of Jonathan, Lucy, and from my own attempt to shed some light on what happened. You were so close to Lucy in her last few weeks. Dr. Van Helsing said you may be able to help with our inquiries. Well, I'm no good at writing things down, but, um, you know, I always lose things. Uh, I like living in organised chaos, which is ironic, given my job. But I do have this. Mr. Seward, can I ask you something? I've been writing all day and my head is full of poor Lucy's turmoil. When listening to your recordings, I heard you mention a Mr. Renfield, and he interested me greatly. I wondered if I may see him, distract my mind for a while, perhaps. Yes, of, co of course, yes. But, but I must warn you, he is an absolute lunatic. Uh, Mr. Renfield, there is a lady here who wants to see you. Why? Uh, she's going through the house, and she wants to see everyone in it. Very well. Let her in. Let her come in by all means, but just wait a minute until I 
tidy up the place. Let's the lady enter. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Renfield. You see, I know you. Dr. Seward has told me a lot about you. You are not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be. No, she's dead. Oh, the lovely lady Lucy was so charming and so gay. <laughs> But she's had a change of heart since tonight she passed away. Now she dances with the devil in the deep, dark water between the devil and the deep blue sea. Oh no, I have a husband of my own to whom I was married before I ever saw Dr. Seward or he me. I am Mrs. Harker. Then what are you doing here? My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. Then don't stay. Why not? How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? What an asinine question. I don't see that at all, Mr Renfield. You will, of course, understand, Mr. Mrs Harker, that when a man is loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, <laughs> but even by his patients, who being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium and are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of this lunatic asylum, I cannot notice but the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates lean towards the others of non causa in ignoratio elenchi. I've never heard you speak so eloquently on elemental philosophy. Do you enjoy discussing philosophy? Religion? Do you have any beliefs? What do you enjoy talking about? Mm. Why, I am myself an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed and insisted on me being put into the good doctor's care. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that by consuming a multitude of live things, no matter how low in the scale of creation one might indefinitely prolong life, at times I held the belief so strongly to, that I actually tried to take human life. On one occasion, I, I even tried to kill the good doctor here for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by a stimulation with my own body of his life and through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase. For the blood is the life. Though indeed the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarised the truism to the <laughs> very point of contempt. Is that not true, Doctor? Yes, yes, quite, quite, sir. Look, now, my dear Mrs. Harker, it is time for us to leave. Goodbye, Mr. Renfield. I hope I may see you again in more auspicious circumstances. Goodbye, my dear. I pray God I never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. Some time passes, and we are now at the meeting. Uh, Professor Van Helsing, I trust your journey from Amsterdam was satisfactory. Travel is only a means to an end, but yes, it was satisfactory, thank you. Now, Mr and Mrs Harker have been with me for a few days now. Ah, the wonderful Madame Mina. She has a man's brain, a brain that a man should have where he much gifted and a woman's heart. Friend John, up to now, fortune has made that woman of help to us. But after tonight, she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers. I think it were a good idea if I tell you something of the kind of enemy of which we now face. 
there are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. I admit that at first I was skeptic, were it not that at the first, what we now, I know, a precious life may have been spared, but who we all loved most dearly. But that is gone. And we must now work that no other poor soul will perish. Nosferatu, do not die like the bee when he stings once. He is only stronger and being stronger have yet more power to work evil. The vampire, which is among us, has the strength of 20 men. He is cunning and highly intelligent. He can, without limitation, appear at will when and where and in any of the forms that are to him. He can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the rat, the owl, the wolf, and the bat. He can at times vanish. How then are we to begin our strife to destroy him? My friends, this is a terrible task we undertake. If we fail, this fight. He must surely win, and there, where end we? Life is nothing. There is not mere life or death. We will become, as him, foul things of the night, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and souls of those we love best. But we are face to face with duty, and we must not shrink away from our holy cause. But we, too, have strength. We have on our side the resources of science. We are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. Let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and of this one in particular. All we have to go on is traditions and superstitions. Let me tell you that this vampire is known everywhere that men have been. In ancient Greece, in old Rome, Germany, France, India, and China. He has been a great warrior and has beaten back the Saxon, the slave, and the devil begotten Hun. The vampire lives on. He cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish and fatten on the blood of the living. He can grow younger, but he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did never see him eat. He throws no shadow. He makes in the mirror no reflection. He can transform himself to a wolf, to a bat, as Madame Nina saw outside Lucy's window. He can come in mist and he can see in the dark. All these things he can do, but he is not free. He is even more a prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He may not enter anywhere unless someone of the household bid him to come in but afterwards he can come and go as he pleases. His powers cease at the coming of the day. He can only change himself at noon or exact sunrise or sunset. Dracula's resting place up until now has been in his home in Transylvania. Being so far from that land, he will have brought with him some of that precious soil to rest in, like a tree whose roots are embedded. He must rest in it to regain strength and energy. It is also said that he can only pass running water on board a ship or across a bridge. Then there are things which afflict him that he has no power over. The garlic, we know of that. The holy crucifix. There are other things too. The branch of a wild rose, a sacred bullet fired into the coffin will kill him. A stake through the heart. We know already of its peace or the cut-off head that gives rest. So, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him. In his life he comes from a great and noble race, the Draculs, who now and again were said to have dealings with the evil one. In the records written by their enemies, the Draculs are referred to as Strogoica, Witch, Ordog, and Pokol. Satan and hell, and in one manuscript, this very Dracula is spoken of as vampire. Now we must settle what we do. Thanks to friend Jonathan's inquiries that the Count's boxes were delivered at Carfax, our first step 
should be to ascertain whether the boxes remain in the house or whether they, any of them have been removed. If they have, we must find them. I must say that now for you, Madam Mina, this night is the end for you. The yeah. end for you. <laughs> you are too precious for us all to risk. We shall act all the more free because you are not in danger. There is no time to lose. I say we look at his house right now. Swift action on our part may save another victim. Uh, um, my apologies, but I must get to the asylum at once. Um, a patient is in urgent need of my assistance. Go on without me. We shall accompany you. It is across from Carfax. We can prepare there and go on to the house after. The time has now come for Renfield's plea. Uh, Mr. Renfield. I want you to release me at once and send me home. I have made a complete recovery. I am the sanest I have ever been in my life. I appeal to your friends. By the way, you have not introduced me. Um, Mr. Arthur Homewood, um, Mr. Harker, and Professor Van Helsing. Van Helsing? What shall any man say at her pleasure of meeting an individual who has revolutionised therapeutics? Gentlemen, I am as sane as at least a majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties. Well, Mr. Renfield, I will come again in the morning. And if you continue to display these signs of sanity, I will arrange for the discharge papers to be completed and you will be released. Dr. Seward, I desire to go at once here, now, this hour, this very moment. Well, I'm afraid that, that will not be possible this evening. Doctor, I implore you, not just for my sake, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reason. But I assure you, my reasoning is good, sound and unselfish. Can you not look into your heart? You would account me among the best and truest of your friends. Can you not tell frankly your real reasons for wishing to be free tonight? Come, sir, you claim that your reason for leaving is of the highest degree. You, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, it is in your best interest to tell us if you will not help us in our efforts. How are we to help you? I have nothing to say. I can only ask you to trust me. If you refuse, the responsibility does not rest with me. Oh, come, my friends, we have work to do. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward, let me implore you. Let me out of this madhouse at once. Send me away, send keepers with me, put me in a straitjacket, but please, <laughs> let me go. You don't know what you are doing by keeping me here. I am speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that I am sane and earnest? Now I am no lunatic. I am a sane man fighting for my soul. Hear me. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Come, come, come now. No, no more of this. We, we've had quite enough already. Get to your bed at once. Dr. Seward, you will, I trust, remember that I did what I could do to convince you tonight. Jack, if that man wasn't bluffing, he's about the sanest lunatic I ever saw. Well, if that man was an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance trusting him. But from everything I have read in Mina's diary, it could all be coincidence, but the night that Lucy first sleepwalked was the night that this man first began yelling about his lord and master. And I fear they may be connected. He even knew that I wanted to marry Lucy and that she had died. 
Now, Professor, you said yourself that that horrid thing has the wolves and the rats to help him. He isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. Well, for his own sake and others, he's better off in that cell now. Quite so. Now, my friends, we are going to terrible danger. We need arms of many kinds. Our enemy is not merely spiritual. We must therefore guard ourselves from his touch. You know Carfax, Jonathan. Or, you know, at least more than we do. Where would the boxes be? Well, during my dealings with the Count, he was very taken with the chapel. I suggest we look there first. Indeed they do. And we are now at Carfax. Time is short. Quickly by count the boxes and place the piece of the host in each of them. That way the count cannot rest in any of these again. 29 boxes, Professor. So far, our night has been imminently successful. No harm has come to us, and we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. It appears we have caught the count unawares. He would not let us move round the abbey so freely had he known our intentions. He has given us the opportunity to cry check in this chess game, which we will play for the sake of human souls. The dawn is close at hand. Let us retire. He will be here any moment. Jonathan Harker hunts for the boxes. The next morning, I set about finding the missing boxes of the Count's Earth. I returned to my original contact, Mr. Billington, who gave me the name and the address of the company responsible for transferring the boxes. I contacted the gentleman in question, uh, Mr. Thomas Snelling, and he confirmed that he had transferred 21 boxes to an address in Piccadilly. It is sold, sir. Excuse me? This house is sold, sir. To whom? I'm not at liberty to divulge that information. I have special reason for wishing to know who purchased it. All I can say is that it is sold, sir. Oh, surely you don't mind letting me know? But I do mind. The affairs of my clients are strictly confidential. I uh, represent the Right Honourable Mr Arthur Holmwood, who wishes to know something of the property, which he understood was for sale. Lord Homewood, one of our most esteemed clients. We are at all times only too happy to meet the desire of his lordship. The house was purchased by a foreign nobleman, the Count de Ville, and sold to him by one of our leading agents, a Mr Renfield, who is unfortunately indisposed at this time. The Count will be moving into the property within the month. Doubtless, we are on the trail of the missing boxes. If we find them all in that house, then our work is near an end. I am sure this is the lair of Dracula. I believe that Dr. Seward's instincts have been proved right about his patient Renfield. The two are now undoubtedly connected. As things turn darker, we now see the demise of Renfield. Oh my God. Poor devil. What on earth has happened? What's happened to my face? It's all right, Renfield. Well, be quiet, Doctor. I must have had a terrible dream. I am... I'm so frightened I can hardly move. Tell us your dream, Mr. Renfield. I must deceive myself or you. It was no dream, but all the grim reality. Quick, Doctor, quick. I am dying. I feel that I have but a few minutes and then I must go back to death. Or worse, do you remember that night I implored you to let me go? I couldn't speak then. In fact, my tongue was tied, but I was the same as I am now. I was in agony of despair for a long time then. Well, then there came a sudden peace to me. Go on, Mr. Renfield. I saw him. He came up to the window in a mist as I had seen him before. 
his eyes were fierce and he was laughing at me. I, I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I know he wanted to. But then he began promising me things, not in words, but by making them happen. And then I knew exactly what I was doing. And I invited him in, saying, come in, Lord and Master. All the next day I waited, but he didn't come. He didn't send me anything. Not even a blowfly. When the moon rose, I was very angry with him. He slid in through my window. He didn't even knock. He sneered at me, looked at me like, I was a nobody. He didn't even smell the same as he went by me. It smelt as if Mr. Harker had come into the room. Mrs. Harker? She didn't look the same. I don't care for the pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and all hers seems to have run out. Do you, do you know what you are saying? I do. It made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. So I grabbed him tight. I'd heard that madmen have in unnatural strength. And as I know, I am one of those madmen. <laughs> I resolved to use my power and he felt it too. I held him tight and I thought I was going to win. I don't want him to take any more life. His eyes burnt into me. He raised me up and flung me down. There was a red mist around me and his voice was like thunder. He's here and we know his purpose. We must go now. You have warned us, Renfield, and we thank you. Mina is cursed by Dracula. Jonathan! Silence! If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eyes. You may as well be quiet. It's not the first time or the second that your veins have appeased my thirst. You the others would you play your brains against mine you would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my dreams i who have commanded nations and have destroyed civilizations could crush them like insects they will know in full before long what it is to cross my path you their best beloved one are now to me flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, kin of my kin, my companion and my helper. You have aided them in attempting to thwart me. Now you shall come to my call. You shall cross land and sea to do my bidding, my pretty Mina. Mina is drawn to him. He strongly holds her head and forces it into his breast. She is made to drink from him and is disgusted and excited. And helping, Seward, Arthur and Harker break in, revealing crucifix. What's happened? Mina, dear, what, what is this? My God, what has this come to? Good God, get out, out, power! Dracula! Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina, I know. Do something to save her. He can't have gone far. Guard her while I look for him. Oh, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me. I have suffered enough tonight. I will not have the thought of in hell hurting you again. Stay with our friends who will watch over us. Do not fear. We are here. And whilst we are close to you, no foul thing can approach. Be calm. Unclean. Unclean. I must touch him and kiss him no more. Jonathan, forgive me, please. Oh, forgive what? 
It is a sin, Jonathan. It is foul, filthy sin. I have tasted him. I have tasted evil, have I not? It is a sin. I have kissed his mouth, felt his breath. I tasted him on my tongue. Oh, that I would die. No, you must live. You must struggle and strive to live. Doctor, you must promise me something. If I am at the point where I am beyond saving, you will end it for me before I take the life of another. Promise me. I give you my word. Mina, what are you saying? It is for your safety and that of others. You must promise me too, Jonathan. Mina, I can't. If there were no friend who loved me, who would not save me such pain, I would do it myself. The dawn is nearly upon us, and we now have an entire day to seek out the Count and destroy the boxes. My dear Mother Mina, you are quite safe here until the sunset. Before I go, let me see you armed against personal attack. Take this sacred crucifix in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Burning away your sins, pretty even, Mira. Even the Almighty shun my polluted flesh. I must bear this mark of shame upon my skin until judgment day. Be a vampire in the end. She will not go to the grave alone. Promise me that. Mr. Harker. Promise me. I do. We are, then let us go at once to Piccadilly. We are wasting precious time. They move on and we are now at the Piccadilly house. Are you sure this is going to work, Jonathan? Lord Homeworld is very well respected to one of the letting agencies. Right. Best clients, they assured me they would do all that they can to aid with his inquiries into this property. We must be patient. Oh, and how was your visit to the agent? My visit was most profitable. <laughs> they said they would not only show me the exterior of the building, but also that I may explore the inside to examine its structure, as long as the spare set of keys is returned by the end of the day. They believe the Count has not yet moved in. Good work, friend Arthur. Now, we must go forth to our terrible enterprise. We are all armed as we were on the first night we visited our enemy's lair. Armed against ghostly as well as carnal attack. And now, my friend, we have a duty to do. We must sterilize this earth that he has brought from a far distant land for such foul use. Uh, this is all. That, that's all of them. Count them. Uh, Twenty. There is one missing. You think to baffle me. You. You with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher's shop. <laughs> you shall be sorry yet, each and every one of you. You think you've left me without a place to rest, but I have more. Your girls that you all love are mine already, mine. And through them, you and others shall be mine to do my bidding and to be my jackals when I choose to feed. There's only one left, Count. You can't escape. Jonathan, my revenge has just begun. It has spread over centuries and time is on my side. We have learned something. His words were spoken bravely, but one thing is certain. He's frightened. He fears us. His very tone betrays him. Mina. There are still hours before sunrise and that maniac is out there again. Mina is alone. I must return to her. She is well protected now. Have a little faith. 
Forgive me, Professor, my faith has been severely tested through this experience. Do as you will, gentlemen, I must go to her. We will all go back to Madame Mina. All we can do for now is done. Now we must think. They all leave and arrive at Mina's bedchamber. Harker is the first to enter. Mina is hypnotized. Go call the professor. I want to see her at once. I need to speak to her. Get her for me, please. What is wrong, Mina? And now, get who, my dear? Professor, you must hypnotize me before the dawn. Why? I believe I can help you find the Count. I'm connected to him now. He has drawn me in, let me into his secret blackened world. I have tasted his blood. Our hearts beat in time. I feel I may be able to connect with him in a way others cannot, but you must do it before the dawn, for I feel that then I can speak and speak freely. Be quick. For the time is short. Where are you? I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It's dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. I can hear the waves clapping against the wooden hull. Then you are on a ship? Oh, yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men stamping overhead. They are shouting, way anchor. And I hear the creaking of a large chain. What are you doing? Oh, I am still. Oh, so still. It's like death. There is still time. It may not be too late. Where, Where do we start looking? That ship, wherever it is, was setting sail as she spoke. Uh, Professor, you said yourself that he's frightened. What is the first thing you want to do when you're taken with such a feeling? You want to go back to familiar surroundings where you know you will be safe. Castle Dracula in Transylvania. He has only one box of Earth remaining and cannot risk it being discovered. But now he knows he is a fox being hunted by a pack of dogs and he is running for his life. This is the time he will act fast and maybe foolishly. If he is ever going to be caught, it is now. We must act quickly and track that ship. But why do we need to chase him? He's gone away from us. Because, my dear Madame Mina, he can live for centuries and you are mortal. Time is to be dreaded. And since he put that mark upon your throat, your time is short. We cannot lose you to the world of the undead. If he plans to return to Transylvania, he will need to go via the port of Vanya. If this be so, then there are only a handful of ships that will head that way, and even with uh, fewer with a single box of earth bound for Transylvania. The dead travel fast. Come to work. The time is now. My revenge has just begun. I will come with you. You can only pass running water on board a ship or across a bridge. I insist upon it. Then we must get there the quickest way, on board the Orient Express, where we should catch his ship as it docks, if indeed it is going to Vanya. Welcome to Transylvania. The Tsarina Catherine bound for Varna. The Tsarina Catherine bound for Varna. Cargo, 50 sacks of sugar, 100 sacks of maize, 400 sacks of coffee beans, and one box of common earth. Bound from Doolittle's Wharf to Varna, the ship left the dock at 7.03 a.m. Where are you? Still dark. What do you hear? I hear the waves against the hull of the ship. Weather fair throughout the day, making good time as we head south on the Atlantic. Docked for supplies in Viana do Castelo, Portugal. Madame Mina. Our poor dear Madame Mina is changing. Changing how? I can see the characteristics of the vampire coming into her face. It is very slight. Her teeth are sharper, her eyes harder. You and I have seen this before with Miss Lucy. Then we must hurry. No one will give up now when we are so close. The sea is now changing. The wind has begun to blow us with more urgency to our next destination, and although rough, it seems to be compelling us onwards. 
we have passed through the Aegean Sea in rapid time, particularly speeding through the night. The crew have seemed somewhat on edge through this time. They speak of an eerie presence in one of the cargo holds below deck. I have assured them it is the swift motion of the sea affecting their senses and tricking them. We are making excellent progress. What do you see? Nothing. All is dark. What do you hear? I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by quicker than before. Well, he's still at sea. He is quickening up. He's speeding the tides himself. We must pray that the elements can be a greater friend to us and ensure that we will beat him to the port. Do you know where you're going and what you're going to? The dead travel fast. Now we have arrived in this ill-fated place, we must arrange what we are going to do when we reach the box. I will cut off his head, and you, Jonathan, will drive a stake through his heart. The Catherine has been sighted entering the Black Sea. He is nearly upon us. It stopped. Where? Can you hear? What can you see? I don't know. It's still dark. Can you Nothing. hear the water? It's running softly and voices are calling, but we have stopped. We docked at Galatz at 1 p.m. The Tsarina Catherine has sailed well. We now unload her cargo. The men are swiftly at work. From Varna onwards. I, I thought he was docking here. He must have altered the ship's course. It does not shock me. It is as I expected. I did not know when or how it would happen, but it altogether seemed far too easy. We have forgotten the primary rule of this game. You must always think several moves ahead in order to outwit your opponent. Check. How far is Galatz from here? At least two days travel. The dead travel fast. Useless. Forget Galatz. If he predicted we would meet him at Barma, he would most definitely predict us going to Galatz. In our next move, we must be two steps ahead. Although he will foresee us reaching Council Dracula, he will not know when. We have the element of surprise. If we go there now, we can cut him off before he reaches the castle. That is still. We can do both. Our greatest asset is our larger number. If the stronger among us can reach Galatz, swiftly we may be able to track him from there and catch him up from behind. You, Professor, can continue as you said and prepare for his travel at the arrival at the castle. I think I should go with the Professor. I want you with me. No, Jonathan. I will be safer with the professor and you safer away from me. And besides, I am of more use to him. I share the Count's memories. I can feel my way around the castle in the dark better than even you could. Let me do this. I need to. Madame Mina is correct. What do you mean to say, Professor, that you would bring Mina in a sad case and tainted as she is with the devil's illness right into the jaws of the death trap? Do you know what the place is? Have you seen the awful den of hellish infamy? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? My friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina that she goes with me. If the Count escapes us this time, he may choose to sleep for a century. And then in time, our dear Madame Mina will come to him and keep him company and join with those others that Jonathan you saw. She must come with me, as she will draw those vile beings out, and so we may purify their souls. Wait! There is something. I can hear men's voices calling near and far. There is a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me, the creak of cartwheels revolving along a dirt track. Come, there is no time to lose. We will be gone to the castle, and we will meet you there if you do not catch him first. May God guard you, my friends. We now follow the men's course of action. We made it to Galatz and immediately discovered the Count's destination is indeed Castle Dracula via the Borgo Pass. 
We have taken horses and we're now following close on his heels. We ride to the death of someone. God alone knows who. Mina and Van Helsing reach Castle Dracula. Welcome to Castle Dracula. Will you not come over to the fire? No. Why? I'm fine. You look so pale and cold. Hold me. Give me comfort. Madame Mina. Hold me, Professor Van Helsing. Come. Come, eat. I shall. I shall make this circle of the sacred ghost around you, Madame Mina. That way you will be safe. Come, sister. Come to us. Back. Back, you dogs. No, no. Do not leave the circle. Here you are safe. But it is for you, I fear. Fear for me. There is none safer in the world from them than I am. Come, sister, come to us. Call me, Professor. Let me be your protector now. Come, sister, come to us. Do not fear. I fear nothing. Come, pretty Mina, come to me. Come, darling Mina, come to me. Come, sister Mina, come to us. I curse thee in the name of Jehovah. Let the light and all the holy ones of heaven curse thee unto the burning flame that liveth forever and unto the torment unspeakable and thy name and seal which I have put in this dwelling of poison shall be torment among great creatures of sulphur and bitter sting burning in fire of earth in the name of Jehovah exalted in power in these three names, Tetragrammaton, Anaphexaton, and Primumaton. These creatures, so radiant that enthrall the very soul of men, God be thanked, Mina, for your cries have not died out from my ears. I steel myself to do my wild deeds. I shall be a butcher at work. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come, come away from this awful place. Let us go to meet my husband, whom I know is coming towards us. Welcome to my house. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. Professor, I warned you, my revenge has just begun. Lucy was my child, sweet and innocent, and you, you, took her from me. You have taken away my companions too. Mina will take their place. I thank you for bringing her to me. You come now to kill Dracula? You are old and foolish. I have the power to control the night. <laughs> Your companions may not be joining us. Seward and Harker, Arthur, enter. Arthur feels he must use the element of surprise and attempts to go for Dracula straight away. As he does so, Seward gauges Dracula has seen him and tries to pull him out of the way, putting himself in the line of fire. And Dracula strangles him as he punishment for getting in the way. I am only too happy to have been on service. Oh, God. As Seward dies, Mina goes as if to reach his body, and when she is low, she secretly retrieves a stake from the hosts around the circle. Dracula then picks up Jonathan and pulls him to him. Oh, my pretty Mina. If you do not leave your circle of hosts, I will dash their brains out in front of your very eyes. 
<laughs> you fools! This is my ultimate revenge! Come, Nina. Take your place by my side and serve me for all time in the shadows between the living and the dead. He calls her to his breast. She drives the stake through his heart. Now oh. is the end for him. In the summer of this year, we made a journey to Transylvania. We went over the old ground, which was and is to us so full and vivid of terrible memories. It was almost impossible to believe that these things which we had seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears were living truths. Every trace of all that had been was blotted out. The broken battlements of Castle Dracula stand against the red sky looking on the final battlefield of the last of the vampires. Let it fade and crumble to dust. We want no proofs. We ask none to believe us. We only hope this story is lost in the midst of time and ancient legend. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The end. Now I'd like to welcome all the uh, cast back on time face so we can see you all. And then I'd like to hand over to my colleague and the creator of uh, the great UK Supporters Network on uh, Twitter, which has created all this and is doing so much for our, our um, arts and everything. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to John Craggs. Oh, my word. Uh... I don't know what to say. Um, there's a lot, uh, nothing prepared, I have to say. Um, first of all, I've got to thank all of you guys. I mean, this has just been, um, there's been quite a lot of work uh, involved and I can't thank enough of, thank you enough for all what you've actually done, um, the time that you've put into it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just, you know, it's just been amazing. And um, I have to just say this, uh, that, you know, um, I think I was weaned many, many years ago on Hammer horror films. Uh, I absolutely adore them. I think, you know, they're just, just wonderful. They're films of their time. Um, and um, I just want to say, and I'll say this in between, I do actually dedicate this, this evening's performance to the memory of two of my favourite actors, uh, the best that I've ever seen, um, the wonderful Peter Cushing and oh. Christopher Lee. Um, so really, um, we're here for two reasons, A, as, as actors to entertain you, uh, the viewers, and we hope that you've had a wonderful time. I hope we've um, created a few, um, you know, spines, you know, shivers down your spines, all that kind of thing. Um, but obviously, one of the main reasons we are here is to raise money um, for our fellow actors, uh, actresses, everybody that works um, within the industry and also quite a lot of our, shall I say, unsung heroes that, um, you know, behind the scenes, people that are not always, the, the public don't always recognize, dressers, um, front of house, yes, they are seen, um, you know, stage management, um, office staff, uh, IT departments, people that keep the, the cogs working. Um, so, for those that are listening um, and watching, um, I, what I would like to ask is, I know it's a very, very um, strange time where Christmas and I hope that we all, or at least you all enjoy what you can with Christmas and hopefully 2021 will be a much better year for all of us, no matter what we do for uh, a living, for what we do in life. Um, but if anyone at any point can, just even if it's a pound, um, Michael has said this, if it's just a pound, a couple of pounds, um, just uh, something that will help because a lot of our freelancers, um, we had it all taken away from us once again, our theater doors, they were closed. Um, we reopened, uh, thousands and thousands of pounds were spent to make all our theaters, all our venues throughout the United Kingdom as safe, COVID safe as possible. And, 
now we've had to close once again. It's heartbreaking, it's disappointing. And um, so there are a lot of people that are really, really struggling um, in our industry. So if you can possibly just, just say just a pound, I don't wanna to sound too desperate here, but anything, it doesn't matter how small, every penny will help and it will help someone uh, it will help someone to feel a little bit better. Maybe they'll be able to 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 buy a meal, be able to go out, this sort of thing. When of course they can. So you know, I, I I really don't know what else to say. It's 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 just something that we we as 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 actors we feel it very very much. Um, and you know, uh, we're, we can spend a majority of our time out of work um, because of the nature of our industry. So we need to to earn money in between. But if we're already working in the industry, and then suddenly we're told to close our doors, you know, it's it's not good. It's not not good not only for our pockets, but it's also not good for our mental health. Um, now, I'm going to bring on another wonderful actress, the fabulous Anna Carteret. And I would like you to say a few words, if you would, please, Anna. Thank you. I, I feel very um, honored to be part of this group and this occasion. And uh, I think that, you know, it is the worst experience anyone's ever been through. And we would all love it if everyone just gave one pound to those of us who are in the worst state of mind. Um, thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Thank you very much, Anna. That's 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 wonderful. Um, so I, I I don't know what more to say. I mean, um, I, I, well, apart from just just recapping on what I've said, uh, this has been a delight. It's been an absolute pleasure um, to to be working with this this wonderful um, cast of actors. Um, although it's not the best of Christmas stories, but, um, you know, in the words of the fabulous Yvette Fielding from Most Haunted, and I'm going to finish on this, um, don't have any nightmares and sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And um, for anyone um, that um, you know that may have missed this, there is going to be a replay and this will be pinned to my account uh, at support british um so you can always watch it at leisure don't watch it after dark we don't want you to have nightmares <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much and good night night bye bye, bye. bye everyone bye. thank you don't have to go i've got that that was for the benefit oh, of the right.